I'd like to welcome you all here today, this afternoon, uh, <clears throat> for today's, uh, today's speaker. Uh, the, <clears throat> that's Pavan Sukhdev, who uh, is the study leader of, of um, here, and the new McCluskey fellow, and the, who's here partly for the uh, uh, Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And you know, I occasionally watch television. And uh, on Sunday, I, I, I saw the uh, PBS series Nature, where they, were, they had a, a program on the ecosystems of Cuba. And uh, well, I see some, not, some, some other people are watching TV at the same time I was. And what was remarkable about this, this program is that Cuba has many relatively unspoiled ecosystems left there as a uh, um, artifact of its relative isolation from world markets for about since the Beatles first took up their guitars. <laughs> and that that, that uh, you know, the program of course showed all the, the ecosystems and the unspoiled glory and efforts how on a shoestring, you know, uh, uh, biologists and, and, and wildlife ecologists in Cuba were trying to study it and to preserve it. And the sense of apprehension that they all felt because as everyone knows, within a f few years, the global market will come to Cuba and, and these ecosystems will be under stress. But then you ask yourself, is it an axiom? Is it axiomatic that uh, there is this conflict, uh, an unavoidable conflict between the global economic system and ecosystems together? And that is uh, partly the, the subject of today's talk and the life work of today's speaker. Pavan Sukhdev, who is a senior banker at Deutsche Bank with their global markets division. He's currently also working with the uh, United Nations Environmental Program to lead their green economy uh, uh, initiative. And he's put out a series of reports uh, under the uh, unfortunate acronym TEEB, TEEB, sounds a little bit like an enzyme to me. <laughs> but it stands for the Economics of Ecosystems and uh, Biodiversity. And I must emphasize here that, that, that Dr. Zukatev is a, a banker. He is a bona fide, uh, uh, innovative actor in the global economic system, is responsible for several uh, 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 tradable securities that have partly drawn India into its proper place in the world, uh, 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 the world market or, uh, for, for uh, capital movement and formation. And so he comes to uh, environmental concerns with uh, one foot in the global economy with a, a, a clear understanding of uh, a practical solutions to some of the uh, environmental problems that we face. And he's going to help tell us in a larger context some of the reasons not to fear the opening of Cuba to global markets. Dr. Tsukdev. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for that uh, lovely introduction to my challenge for the next 45 minutes or an hour. And uh, let me first agree with you that I also think TEEB is a horrendous acronym, and, and uh, I wish we had called this project 10, The Economics of Nature. So much easier. Come trips off the tongue so much more easily, and its reports would have been published in 2010 at the Convention on Biological Diversity, as they were last year in Nagoya. And, uh, it would be COP10, which would be receiving these reports. So uh, in hindsight, it made a lot of sense to do this. But of course, unfortunately, I'm not that clever. I didn't think of this until last year, which was a bit too late. It is unfortunately known as TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. It's a mouthful. I'll come back to that point in a, in a few moments. Um, when Tom approached me for this, this speech, I said, sure, I'm very happy to speak for you anytime. But what about? And he says, oh, well, give us a few options. So I wrote him an email with a few options, some green economy, some about uh, you know, wealth accounting and valuation for ecosystem services, a new World Bank project, and a few others. And I said, well, there's this other thing called what's the world worth, you know, um, a little bit cheeky. 
So he says, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is the reason why you have today a session which I call, what's the world's worth? So let's ask this question, what is it worth? So the world, of course, is the biosphere, right? So to, to think what it's worth, you need to uh, first check out a world without a biosphere. Uh, some of you would recognize Mars. No biosphere, no species that we particularly know of or care for, and no human beings, no exchanges between human beings, no economy, zero is, is the size of the economy there. And uh, move away and we come to a different world, which you are familiar with, uh, where there is a biosphere and there are species and uh, uh, there are even cell phones and, <laughs> and there are certainly exchanges, economic exchanges, and there is, if you like, one economy. Well, to go from one to the other, uh, basically the answer is one economy minus zero economy divided by zero economy. So one minus zero divided by zero is basically infinity. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so where's the drinks then? <laughs> No, so I will, I will now tell you what the, the, the real subject of this is about, the economic invisibility of nature. And that's really what I'd like to speak with you about. But before we do that, I'd just like to take a little detour and, and show you uh, a movie, a, a very short movie of about a minute, uh, which was made for us by some young filmmakers. This is, by the way, a movie of three which won... Uh, was selected for some awards as good ways of communicating to people what is this all about, the value of nature, and why is uh, economic invisibility of nature a problem, and what needs to be done, and so on. Uh, this was a competition run for aspiring ad filmmakers, and uh, I'm delighted to say that we submitted these three movies, and one of them, not this one actually, even though I like this, uh, won a prize which uh, was at the Rome Film Festival in November last year. So here we have something which talks about the value of nature. Mr. Dawson? Yes? Mother Nature here. I'm here to collect the last month's nature meeting. Nature usage? Okay, let me see. The sun rose and set. Oh, look at that. Every day. The one that came breeze on Tuesday. And let's not forget gravity. Oh, let's see what that bundle of good cream is an apple. The eye is making passion. And the last week you stood at the rim of the Grand Canyon for that amazing view. Give the price tag on that, can you? Just kidding. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> the new rain barrel and the tree you planted. That should just about offset all the electricity you used with that air conditioner. Let's just call it a wash. Hey, what? We do it in my house all the time. And I see you're running a little behind on your oxygen bill. I wouldn't let that concern you very long if I were you, Mr. Well, I'm a little short this week. <laughs> So a, a, little, a little brutal, but I think it gets the point across. And uh, this, this, this is what TEEB is about. It, TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, is not just about compiling, as we have done in a, in a scholarly tome written by a collaboration of almost uh, 80 economists and ecologists on the economics of ecosystems, but it's also about presenting the results of this work to people who matter. And the people who matter and who make decisions are policymakers, administrators at the local level, businesses, and individuals. And wisely, we were advised, uh, do not write a book for people. For God's sakes, they don't read. Make films. So we, this, is, this is what we did instead. So let me now get back to uh, the talk that wasn't and talk to you about uh, what this film was about, which is the economic invisibility of nature, why it's a problem, and why we need to end it. Well, firstly, of course, nature, the biosphere, numerous beautiful ecosystems, amazing species and diversity, and genetic material. Um, the picture here, which you'll recognize as the Amazonian rainforest, to many, uh, a place of incredible <laughs> species diversity, uh, but beyond that also, a massive carbon store, because tropical forests like this, in fact, provide significant climate change benefits, mitigation services, if you like. Uh, tropical forests cover 
almost a fourth of terrestrial carbon. And uh, they also are providing a mitigation service in terms of capturing carbon. It, recent studies have shown that uh, peak forests, climatic forests are actually absorbing carbon literally from the atmosphere, farming carbon dioxide as, as their, uh, their manure, so to speak. And that accounts for something like five or 4.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide capture every year, which means that's almost 15% of total uh, emissions of, of CO2. And that's a very significant mitigation engine. But of course, do we conserve them and make use of them for that? No, we are losing tropical forests quite significantly still due to deforestation. Um, a study was done, the, uh, the Eliash Review, a couple of years back, which estimated the value of halving deforestation was of the order of three or four trillion dollars. And with that element of, of economic opportunity or benefit, if you like, in stopping deforestation, the question needs to be asked, why doesn't it happen? And of course, the problem is no one pays for this mitigation service. But not only that, this same rainforest is also a water pump. It is actually providing, thanks to the precipitation that comes from the northeastern trade winds as, as they produce rainfall, uh, which is seeded by almost 20 billion tons, an estimated 20 billion tons of water, uh, ev water evaporation into the, into the atmosphere from the Amazonas rainforest. They're basically providing the water supply for the entire La Plata basin and its agricultural economy of several hundred billion dollars worth. And then the question has to be asked, well, does Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, or for that matter, uh, does the state of Mato Grosso pay anything to the state of Amazonas for this fresh water supply? And the answer is no. Once again, the answer is zero. So as we explore this whole point about the services of nature, these so-called ecosystem services, again and again and again across this entire spectrum of the three tiers of what is uh, in CBD language called biodiversity, the ecosystem level, the species level, the genetic level. If we look at all of the attributes, that is the extent, the abundance of the population on the one hand and the diversity on the other, and we look at what's provided, be it recreation and water regulation, carbon storage from ecosystems, or be it food, fuel, fiber, and pollination services from species. By the way, there is a, a study done on global pollination services which estimated the value of pollination services as of the order of 150 billion euros. That's about nearly 200 billion US dollars, which is nearly uh, eight, 9% of the total agricultural output of, of, of the world. Well, all of these are, are essentially, other than a few exceptions like food which is priced and timber which is priced, all of these services tend to be in the nature of public goods and services and most of them are provided free. And that's the challenge. Most of nature's services are economically invisible. And if and when, uh, as we do lose these services, we have to think about the, the failed economic thinking that goes behind looking at markets as the only means of pricing and recognizing that there are ways of recognizing value and appreciating value and demonstrating value which do not necessarily rely on a market price. And why we don't go there is, is really something that we need to address. I illustrate the point of um, looking at trade-offs in economics with this simple example, which is from a study done by um, Ed Barbier and others from South Thailand. And here in, in this area, as in many parts of Southeast Asia, there has been a, a continuous degradation of the mangrove belts because of deep of conversion into shrimp farms. And the logic is economic. It's that a typical hectare of uh, rainforest, oh, sorry, of, of uh, mangrove forest, if converted into a shrimp farm over uh, a nine-year period, which they selected in that study, produces a value of something like nine and a half thousand dollars. But the same place if it were left as a mangrove swamp and just providing fuel wood benefits to local communities would be worth only about six hundred dollars. But what that uh, comparison obviously would fail to pick up is that most of the money that is being produced, the so-called profits of shrimp farming are actually subsidies, local government subsidies. So the comparison is not, not that significant. And also what that comparison has failed to look at because the lens being used was that of just private profits is that there is a cost to uh, land use of converting a mangrove to a shrimp farm because salt deposition and chemical depositions over time make that land unusable even for shrimp farming. So somebody has to pay 
for a cost of restoration, or at least recognize that there is a cost of restoration. And that cost is estimated at something like $12,000. And on the flip side, the mangrove provides coastal protection, storm and cyclonic defense, which was estimated at about $12,000. So the real comparison, if we account for public benefits, and not just private profits, the real comparison is not between plus 9,000 and plus 600, but actually it's more like minus 11,000 and plus 12,000. So the trade-off choice that you'd make with this payoff diagram is obviously the opposite of what you make with this. That's using the lens of just private profits. That's using the lens of total wealth. Once again, this is the issue of the commons, uh, the, the tragedy of the commons, but a small example. But un unfortunately, it is just a small example because a study recently showed that if we looked at uh, the listed companies, this was a study constructed bottom up, so it's literally company by company, done by a group called TrueCost. They came to a staggering answer that there was something like $2.2 trillion worth of externalities, in other words, social costs borne by society as a result of global businesses doing business as usual. And that's huge. We are talking about almost 3% of the global GDP. And that's not even the end of the story because that's just the top 3,000 companies. If you take all private corporations, then the answer is almost twice that. So I think the first reason why we must end the economic invisibility of nature is because just calling it an externality is not good enough these days. It is huge. It is just too significant, even in economic terms, in estimated economic terms, for it to be just ignored as a marginal issue. Um, but it goes beyond that. Let's take coral reefs, for example. Now, uh, the question to be asked, this is the Great Barrier Reef, uh, and that's um, a tiny helicopter there, just to give you a sense of, of scale. Picture taken by Jan Artos Bertrand. To, I'm grateful to him for having provided his amazing library of slides free to Teeb. As, as indeed with the Teeb project, you find a remarkable community feeling. People come to this project with an appreciation that, yep, the economic invisibility of nature is a problem. Uh, you guys are working on this. Can we help? And that's very much been the story of Teeb. It's very much a collection of economists, ecologists, zoologists, social anthropologists, government servants, politicians, businessmen who are basically working on the same problem. Is how do we fix this? Well, sorry, coming back to the, the point I was making with coral reefs. So the question is beyond the beauty and, and, and uh, um, spiritual value, in a sense, of coral reefs as sources of inspiration. Are there social implications? And a study was done recently which estimated at almost 500 million the number of people who are dependent on coral reefs through fisheries, the fact that corals are the, the seeding ground of nurseries of fish, and through tourism and through related and ancillary activities. There's almost half a billion people who in some way or the other across these populous areas of, of uh, Asia Pacific Islands, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, coming across all the way to Madagascar, the Andaman Islands, um, and the whole of the Caribbean. There's a huge population of people who are not necessarily wealthy, uh, not necessarily uh, with options of livelihood, who depend upon the fisheries and the tourism and the ancillary industries around these. And that dependency is huge. Can you just imagine that if absent these coral fisheries, what options would they have? The Philippines today actually has plans to attend. It has estimated that there's something like 25 million people out of its population of 80 million who are susceptible to this kind of uh, dislocation. And it's quite difficult to suggest that alternative employments, livelihoods, locations to live, and food can easily be provided in the absence of coral reef fisheries. And as you know, corals are uh, a species, an entire ecosystem at risk. If there is any ecosystem today which is at a threshold of a potential collapse, it's the corals because of this combination of factors leading from uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Not only is warming uh, more, more than likely to create more uh, events of the kind of the bleaching that took place in 98, but also uh, the increasing uh, uh, acidity of oceans or the declining alkalinity of oceans due to the absorption of that carbon dioxide makes it more difficult for aragonite to form and to regenerate a coral reef after it's been bleached. So there's a double whammy acting against the corals thanks to increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. So there is a serious risk here which is not just an entire ecosystem but also the half billion people who are dependent on that ecosystem. Um, 
Another, another area where this comes up uh, quite starkly is if we look at forests and the role that they play in supporting poverty. And typically when we look at forest ecosystem services, and if we were, and it's, it's, a, it's just a, a comparison which is for, for the sake of comparison, if we were to look at um, ecosystem services and their values in three countries, India, Indonesia, and Brazil, we find the range is in terms of size, these services are valued at between 10 and 20% of the GDPs of these countries. So uh, you might be forgiven for ignoring them because you know, even GDP is inaccurate and it's an estimate and so on. But the reality is that if you look at specific populations who are dependent on these ecosystems, absent the forests, uh, the people who suffer floods and droughts are basically subsistence farmers. Absent the forests, the, the wives who cannot collect fuel wood more than 40% in, in across the world and 60% in, in these countries, who depend on fuel wood in, in India, for instance, uh, are basically the wives of subsistence farmers and agriculturists who live in and around forests. And of course, absent the forest, cattle and goats cannot graze off the leaf litter. So once again, the, the dependencies are very strongly in the area of smallholder farming. And these populations are massive, 350 million in India, 99 million in Indonesia. These are estimates made by uh, three studies done for team to look at what is the ecosystem service uh, dependency of poor households. And if we work out their total household incomes, and instead of just doing a, a rather simplistic divide services by GDP, we say divide services consumed by the poor as a fraction of their livelihood incomes, then that answer is, is much higher. We are talking about half to 90%, and that's actually a, a critical factor to appreciate that the invisibility of nature is not just a generic overall problem for society, but it's a particularly sharp problem in terms of development strategy and development paradigms. Because if we fail to appreciate this, then our entire development model, if it is relying, for instance, too much on trickle down or relying too much on built infrastructure, may not even achieve the purposes for which it was designed. And that, that's a challenge that we have to address. So I would then say that the second and additional reason why we must try to end the economic invisibility of nature is that uh, business as usual uh, nature losses will perpetuate poverty. It will not it is not possible, in my opinion, to um, change or alter the livelihoods of so many people. We are talking about 1.2 billion who are dependent on land-based ecosystems, forestry, and dependent through subsistence agriculture on, on, these, on these ecosystems. It's quite difficult to imagine alternative livelihood solutions for such a large population in, in any reasonable span of time. So TEEB and its five reports, uh, which were presented at the, at the COP10 meeting last year in Nagoya, uh, really is about uh, looking at solutions. I think in our initial report, the interim report published way back in 2008, we did rely on a few studies done to estimate the size of the, uh, the economic uh, size, if you like, of the losses. In other words, the human welfare impacts of these losses. And we compiled that and as a demonstration of the significance of the problem, the economic significance of the problem of losses. But what we have done with the phase two of the T project is to actually look at solutions. And that's what the rest of my conversation today with you is about, which is looking at various solutions and how they work and why they work and why they don't work in some cases. So we have actually written the TEEB reports very much with an end user in mind, with a decision maker in mind and written separately for the, the scientists and economists, separately for policymakers, separately for business people, and separately for local governments. And when we talk valuation, and I think that was, if you like, the serious point behind, behind my, my flippant start to this session. When we talk about valuation, we are not actually talking about uh, Cuba uh, and converting it into a, a tradable commodity in terms of its amazing ecosystems. But we are talking about valuation as a human institution. And that's exactly the words from the T book, this is which I'm using. Our chapter on valuation uh, is lead authored not by an economist, not by an ecologist, but by Eduardo Bronzizio, who's in fact a social anthropologist. And he looks at valuation in the broad context of how societies value, and valuation as a feedback mechanism into society. Valuation is something that works at a spiritual level, at a societal level. You can recognize value in many different ways, and there are many countries with communities which place, uh, if you like, the ultimate value uh, to forests because they consider them sacred forests. You cannot put a price on that at all. 
it is valuable because it's sacred, period, end of discussion. And there are other communities, such as here in the US, where areas of human heritage have been declared to be reserves and national parks for over a century, oh, sorry, more than a century and a half, in fact. So clearly, at that point, the economics of the Yosemite National Park were not considered. It was just you know, one amazing place and so on, and well, likewise in, in other parts of the world. So human society does respond to value, uh, appreciates value and responds to value without any reference to economics, and that's fine. That is perfectly acceptable. It, it can also respond to demonstrating value, and it can also respond to capturing value. Sometimes you can just demonstrate and have policy change. So Thiebe's approach is to look at valuation in totality and not just to look at a fraction of the valuation space. So therefore, we have identified basically five different broad categories of strategies in the form of reflecting ecosystem services, the value that ecosystems deliver uh, in regional land planning, reflecting ecosystem services in legislative change in terms of, for example, new protected areas or, or changing the way that you access protected areas, uh, reflecting it in certification, eco-certification and eco-labeling, which is a combination of policy and, and business, reflecting it in... in uh, uh, payments for ecosystem services. Indeed, the, uh, the report of TEAB, which is the, the, the red-covered report, um, I shall, I, when, we, when we go for drinks, I'll bring up some copies for you people to pick up of these reports, They're at least the executive summaries, which are all very slim. Uh, the reports themselves are somewhat massive, and they are on the website, but and there are copies of the executive summaries available. So we address in the TEAB for local governments more than 120 case studies of policy action local policy action, which has in some way or the other either recognized value or demonstrated value and made use of any one or more of these strategies. And I'll talk to you about uh, some of my favorites. But the other point I'd like to make before I go on to the examples is that these same strategies actually span a whole host of operating spaces. Because in terms of regional land planning and legislation, we're talking about policy and regulation. In terms of certification and protected area evaluations, we are talking about at least an economic uh, assessment, if not an economic mechanism. And then finally, in payments for ecosystem services, these are mechanisms where a party pays or parties pay and another party receives. So you are internalizing the externality, you're capturing the value. And then, of course, there are markets. And I wouldn't call a payment for ecosystem service a market because there's usually one, one buyer and one seller or one community that's buying and selling. But there are also markets. There are biodiversity markets. There are, uh, there are wetland banking markets right here in the US. So there are also market solutions, but please note, and this is my uh, response to not just Cuba, but also Bolivia and Venezuela, because they keep thinking that somehow TEAB is about just parceling their country into pieces and selling it, but that's not. Because, because the market square, if you like, is actually a subset of a subset of a subset of valuation, and, and that's putting market solutions in perspective. I'm not dismissing market solutions. They can be very effective at times, but they're not the only solution, and it is not possible to put prices to everything. Um, or indeed to, to uh, uh, believe that the market solution is the best in some cases, it may not be the best, howsoever defined. So let me pick uh, these five strategies that I talked about and talk to you about uh, my favorite examples of these. In terms of regional land planning, the Baxing County in, in China actually redrafted its, its land use master plan using the Invest software and going through, as you can see in this diagram, a, a fairly detailed mapping of where valuable ecosystem services were coming from. So they did have a significant amount of development, land use change as part of their county plan, but that it was sensitive to where were the areas of biodiversity and, and ecosystem services. So they were sensitive to nature as a result of making use of this software for their mapping. Uh, in terms of legislations, and once again, legislations which did not go into the economics in detail, uh, but I think the, the legislation of the Tobahata Reefs National Park in the Philippines is, is a very interesting example because it came about as a result of the bleaching event in 98 and a stakeholders meeting that was organized, including fisher folk and NGOs and the governments, and came about with the idea that there should be a no-go zone to be able to allow the reefs to recover their fisheries value and their ecotourism value. And that no-go zone was subsequently increased a few years later by almost double the amount. By. And the results are there for people to see that you are seeing an increase in live coral cover 
in this area, and you're seeing an almost fourfold increase in the amount of fish. An example of a protected area evaluation, now once again, I emphasize no money has changed hand in, in either the reef, uh, color reef case, but it's now we're getting into the economic calculations. And here was a wetland outside the city of Kampala, that is Uganda's capital, which was slated to be uh, dammed and, and uh, converted to additional land to be used for agriculture. Until an economist did a study which demonstrated that the value of the wetland as a, um, as, as a sewage treatment plant, effectively, as a natural sewage treatment plant for the city of Kampala was about $2 million, whereas the alternative value of that land in net of, net of the costs of conversion was scarcely over two fifty dollars or $300,000. So leaving the wetland as a sewage treatment facility for the city was actually economically seven, eight times more valuable than converting it. And that argument, that economic argument, apparently uh, did have sway and uh, subsequently the Nakivubo Swamp has been included in, in a green belt and I'm delighted that it's still, still there. Another uh, benefit of keeping the swamp as it was, was that the livelihoods of the local fisher folk, because this is an active swamp, uh, the livelihoods of the local fisher folk were also retained. So here's an example where um, evaluating an area and just demonstrating the value, once again, no money changing hands as such, but demonstration of value made a difference. And I have uh, a final example here, which is from uh, Japan, where the conference was held last year. <laughs> Uh, one of their so-called Satoyama, which is uh, um, um, basically landscapes which are eco-social uh, landscapes, as they call them. Um, the white stalk, the oriental white stalk, had uh, gone locally extinct in, the, uh, in Honshu Island, in the area close to the city of Toyoka. And uh, Toyoka City decided to cap keep a few breeding pairs from, from the U.S., from Russia, and made use of uh, a change in uh, farming practices, starting to farm on the basis of uh, wet paddy in winter, not just dry paddy, because that is, with wet paddy, you get the frogs and other species that the stalk feeds on. So they were able to effectively reintroduce the white stalk with just about 200 hectares of, of organic rice and wet paddy in winter. So a change in system led to a uh, species reintroduction which was dear to the people of Toyoka City. Uh, it had other benefits. It, thanks to the introduction, the, the means of the introduction was actually an incentive, a payment for the ecosystem services. So they actually paid 40,000 yen per thousand square meters of organic farming to offset the additional costs that the farmers would face of wet paddy in winter. And they also supported a certification scheme so that those farmers who used this organic farming practice or this eco-friendly eco practice, depending on how much, could, be certi could certify their rice as white stock rice. And that certification combined with this organic farming fetches prices of between 20 and 50% higher in the Japanese marketplace because of, again, the association of good practice with that farming. Uh, so it's been a successful experiment. It's still very much in what I would describe, I've been down there and I've actually seen two breeding pairs of white stock. So it is, it is true, it's not a story. Um, but it struck me as much more a sort of hobby farming because the people there were not poor farmers, they were just normal, city folks who were doing farming anyway, and they decided to have a, a patch in that particular area, which led to the reintroduction of the white stock. So this hobby farming success has had other positive externalities in that there is an ecotourism center on the white stock that's been built, which collectively earns through its visitors and, and fees and so on, something like $10 million a year. And uh, that's huge. And uh, the benefits to the prefecture have been significant. They've actually, that. Uh, they've actually, the, the city municipalities' um, incomes have increased by 1.4%, which if anyone is familiar with the economy of Japan is actually a big number, it's not a small number. Yeah. Uh, these examples that I give you are, are amongst 100 plus examples that are there of local success stories around the world and which are on this website, the Europa Atlas website as it's called. Uh, it's very straightforward, anyone from here is interested can log in there. Uh, go to whatever interests you. And for example, if you take the community forestry in Nepal, if you click in there, you'll see uh, a bit more detail in terms of what it's about. And if you click in further, then you'll see a whole page or two pages of text which describe the project, the policy context, the economics. And hopefully our purpose here is to encourage 
Our purpose here is to demonstrate that there are solutions, that they work, and there are working solutions at, at local level, which are addressing particular problems of um, ecological loss and environmental degradation, and reversing those losses through constructive means of, of changes in policy and incentives and PES and land use plan man management and so on and so forth. On the commercial side as well, there seems to be a, a few changes happening. Um, of course, you're all familiar with the, the fact that the organic industry is still showing remarkable growth. Certified product, product, products, basically forest certified and, M and marine certified, MSC certified uh, fish are amazing success stories and forest certification is increasing by leaps and bounds. And we have uh, of, of late uh, the store chain called Sainsbury's in the UK announced that it will only sell MSC or farm fish, period. No, no ocean fish, fish at all. And that's a remarkable uh, decision for, for a commercial outfit which is quite significant in the UK marketplace. Um, in addition, there are any number of uh, leading names like Mars and Cadbury and Kraft and Unilever who've taken on board rainforest certification or forest certification quite seriously as part of their product suite. And um, not just consumers but also investors are looking at biodiversity as, as a, a source of new business. Uh, when I was in Japan, I learned that Sumitomo Bank had created a new fund, a biodiversity fund, looking at companies which do all kinds of things which are either biodiversity positive or looking at problems and solving problems. Uh, some bizarre companies, there was one company in this fund which actually created artificial coral reefs by some form of electrolytical uh, stimulation. And it was quite interesting to see its demonstration project. But there are also companies which are in organic farming business and certification business and so on. But they are basically looking at companies which have a focus on nature, on restoring nature or, or responsibly using nature and putting those companies into a separate fund. So clearly there is some interest even on the investor side. So I think this combination of examples of local success stories of policy-driven success, more than 100 of them on our website across the world, and quite a few commercial success stories suggest that there is a, a rationale. There is a rationale to look at um, moving away from economic invisibility simply because there are so many solutions. Why not address a problem if you can see solutions? Dwelling on that theme for a bit more, we can go away from thinking of all of the damage and, and loss that is taking place in nature from a negative point of view, but looking at it more positively. Um, I think the community, uh, the environmental community, and indeed the biodiversity community probably does itself a disservice by just speaking too much of the problems and not enough of the solutions. And I, I see it differently. I think you, you need to recognize and appreciate risks and losses but at the same time you need to address opportunities. And if we look at typically what we talk about, carbon dioxide emissions as a problem, but at the same time we need to see that biocarbon offsets and, and red plus are huge potential solutions waiting around the corner. I was interviewing someone today who's, who's a young lady here working on a biochar project as, as, a, as a, new, a new company. There are estimates of red plus, for instance, which suggest that that could be, oh, there she is in the background. Hello, Vidisha. So there are, there are solutions on Red Plus which are available, being tested around the world, and there are estimates which I've received of a potential for Red Plus as a potential 30 to $100 billion marketplace. That's not small by any measure. Of course, we are concerned about habitat disturbance and conversion. And um, on the flip side, then we have biodiversity offsets and conservation banking um, solutions. Water use and freshwater security is a huge problem around the world, but at the same time, we do have payments for ecosystem services. Out of the 100 plus examples that I, I mentioned in our team for local uh, governments, there are 25 examples of freshwater payments for ecosystem services. And the marine footprint is a problem, and I will spend a few moments now talking about that. But then, of course, we can look at marine certification and good old-fashioned conservation, protected areas, marine protected areas, as an economic solution. And of course, pollution and waste does have an industry behind it. There's recycling, there's waste management, there's tradable permits for waste, and so on and so forth. But let me just uh, dwell a bit on the fisheries issues, because fisheries is both a huge challenge for us today, uh, fi and fisheries is also an, a remarkable example of economics, good economics not being applied. First, a few words, and just a few words on the problem, because it does have so many dimensions. 
it's not just a, the fact that you know, we are by various accounts fishing down the food web and depleting fish stocks at a level which is unsustainable, at a rate which is unsustainable, which will potentially lead to a loss of an industry which is 85, 90 billion dollars worth of landed catch of marine fisheries. But beyond that is the 30 odd million jobs that are at risk because as these stocks get depleted, especially the, uh, the poor fisher folk who are, who are affected, there's of the 35 odd million, about 30 million of those jobs are basically artisanal or poor fisher folk who are dependent on these fisheries for their personal survival and for taking that fish to the local market. So there's a huge equity problem here in terms of the way that um, these, these losses are, are being driven. And please note that the main drivers of these losses, the over, over fishing in the seas, is basically open access, which is the design of the, of the global laws, the UN Convention for the Law of the Seas. Open access on the one hand, and which leads to the tragedy of the commons, and also subsidies, because we have something like 27, the latest estimate was $27 billion of subsidies, largely which are um, leading towards increasing fleet capacity so that trawlers can fish further and fish deeper and actually exacerbate the problem. Now, those of you who are from the economics profession will understand that we are all about scarce resources. But the scarce resource, and therefore we should be investing in scarce resources, but the scarce resource here is fish. The scarce resource is not fishing capacity, and yet that's exactly what we are investing in. And guess what? It's your taxes and my taxes that are being used to invest in even more fishing capacity. Uh, a colleague of mine, Rashid Sumaila, is from British Columbia. He wrote in our chapter on the green economy on fisheries that he estimated that uh, overcapacity in fishing was between 180 and 280 percent, and yet we are investing in more fishing capacity. It just defies logic. Uh, here's a, a, a calculation which comes to you from a study done by uh, the World Bank and the Food and Agricultural Organization. And what they've calculated is the increase in, in fishing uh, capacity that is taking place, and at the same time, a decline, a simultaneous decline in the catch per unit capacity. So the net effect of these two trends, increasing capacity and decline in catch, is actually nothing. Just multiply one by the other. You, you just get F, no change. So all that's happened is a static situation with more effort being spent with bigger fleets and greater capacity to fish the same amount of fish. And the economic underutilization that is taking place here, the under-optimization, is basically estimated at about $50 billion. So just think of these numbers. $50 billion of economic inefficiency, $27 billion of your money and mine being paid in subsidies, effectively, to this industry, and a total landed catch of $85 billion. I mean, if, if there is a better example of global economic stupidity, I, I'd like to be told what that is. But this is my, my I vote for this candidate. But the good news is that apparently there are solutions, and I'm told by, I'm not a scientist, I'm told by the experts that if you look at marine protected areas, there is a very strong rationale why they do work, which is that female fish, as they grow twice the size, they could produce 10 to 100 times as many eggs. And you just need to uh, have patience and have transition plans because you will have losses in communities, which are fishing communities, who, have, uh, who are unable to access those, those waters during the time that you are rebuilding fish stock. So you do need some money set aside for that, but certainly not as much as $27 billion. And in fact, Rashid's estimates were that something like $300 billion of total investment would be sufficient to address the fleet capacity downsizing concerns and uh, to be able to generate in his, in his estimation value of stock, which is almost five times as much uh, compared to the investment in capacity downsizing and transition support for livelihoods of communities or fishing communities. Let's look at an example and see whether this theory holds or not. So this is actually from not that far away. This is off George's Bank, uh, the fishing area. And these, uh, these dots, these colored dots, are actually satellite measurements of the vessel hours. The ves because there are no-go zones, such as this triangle, this one, this rectangle, and this rectangle. Since there are no-go zones, um, vessels have to carry uh, satellite identification, satellite readable identification. And you can map how long they've been in these various areas. And in this, uh, in this map, what you see is those blue areas where they are not very much, and the other colors, as in yellow, green, and, and orange, and so on, where they have spent more hours. And of course, you can see that in the no-go areas, generally speaking, there is no fishing. Well, of course, you know, by mistake, I'm sure a few people wandered into this, into this zone. <laughs> there are a few dots inside. But 
I mean, the point could be made by a fishing community said, see, Mr. Sukhdev, we told you this. We are losing livelihoods. There's almost none of us here, and definitely none of us here. And we are right, and you are wrong. But then I invite you to look at this small triangle in greater magnification. And so here's the next picture, again, satellite, which is this. All of the fishing is taking place, guess what? At the rim, at the edges of the protected areas. Because of course, nobody told the fish that this is a protected area, so they won't, won't wander out and they get uh, nicely caught by, by the, 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 nets, the nets of the waiting fishing fleets. All of the heavy fishing is in that area. Evidence, if any, is needed that yes, the theory does work. Fishery stocking does happen and it is commercially valuable. So it is a commercially valuable activity to look at marine protection as an investment in the scarce resource, fish, not more trawlers, please, not more fishing capacity. Going away from fish, although I'd love to stay with fish for a long time, but going away from fish, uh, if we look at the size of the economy and we look at how much is um, churned as turnover, the turnovers of all these, all these industries are global turnovers. These estimates were done by colleagues at Deutsche Bank and they estimated, this is a couple of years back when we did the report, but it's probably not that far away now uh, since the recession. Uh, global automobile sector, about $2 trillion of turnover. So that's the value that we consumers, buyers of cars, place on cars. And add that up and you get $2 trillion. The value of steel placed on steel by whoever buys steel. The value of IT software and services, about a $1 trillion. And then a study uh, done in Cambridge uh, by some scientists and economists estimating the total value of the global, if you like, um, conservation business the total 10% of land mass, which is in 100,000 plus conservation areas, produce ecosystem services, according to their estimates, of the order of four and a half to $5 trillion. So if you like, that's the value that is consumed by us human beings as well, in some form or the other, but not paid for, because these products of the protected areas, once again, are public goods and services. We don't pay for them, there's no market, so you can't measure it precisely as you can all of the other things I just mentioned. Similarly, we compared capital, in other words, the capital invested in these, and again, it's trillions of between $200 billion for the IT services sector, small, uh, to as much as $2 trillion for the automotive industries. And this is an estimate based on, in fact, a 4% discount rate, so people might question that as to why that is, that is a good answer. But that's an estimate based on a, a, a relatively high discount rate of the natural capital value that resides in these protected areas. And if you look on the right hand side, the number of people employed globally across these sectors, you come to a startling recognition that the answers, these are direct employees by the way, as in directly making cars in factories or directly making steel, involved in steel companies. These are sort of headcounts of the major companies in these sectors, or six million people directly writing software and advising on software. And if you look at the, the estimates, and there were very few available on the total number of people employed in protected areas, largely government employees, the largest estimate was 1.3, 1, 1 so I've gone a bit conservative said, well, let's say 1.5, or at least not more than 1.5 million across the world. And then the question is, is this sensible? I mean, is, is there an opportunity here waiting? If we have valuable services which do deliver value to society, public investment should be about investing in public wealth. There is public wealth tied up in these protected areas. They are delivering value to society. Why don't we spend more, as in employ more people, to do that protection well? Why have protected areas where you have, in some parts of the world, one person per you know, 1,000 square kilometers? And how is that one person supposed to know what's going on in his 1,000 square kilometers of dense forest? It's, it's an absurdity. Even smaller areas, I'm familiar with a particular park outside my hometown of Bombay where I spend a lot of time when I visit. Uh, they have 100 guards to look after 100 square kilometers. Bombay is a city of 18 million people. You can come in, steal, take, convert, do whatever the hell you like, that one person is not likely to find you even, even one square kilometer. So having a million point something of them to cover 10% uh, of the Earth's surface sounds a little bit like an underestimate of the capacity, the human capacity that you need to manage these areas. Which of course brings you to the point that because they are public goods and service providers, they are not valued and that's the reason why they are underinvested. It follows. So another argument I would give is that we need to look at the productive and employment potential, whether you're looking at the productive potential of fisheries around the world, or whether you're looking at the employment potential of, of protected areas around the world. You need to look at that. And once again, there is some good news. Uh, in India, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act has created by 
paying poor people off season 100 rupees, which is like $2, um, paying people to look after their local ecology, rebuilding forests, uh, building small earthen dams, basically manual labor to fill up the labor gap within between the, uh, uh, the agricultural seasons. They've actually created something like an ongoing 30 million additional jobs every year during off season, which is a great example of rebuilding natural capital, paying people, not a huge amount if you add it all up, how much it is, but actually achieving reconstruction of natural capital and rewarding people for it. I want to clo close with a, a quick look at uh, reporting because very often we talk a lot about solutions and we don't talk about what we measure. And unfortunately, it is my view that what we do not measure, we do not manage. And if we look at this example of some measurement that was done in corporate reports. Now, these reports were done for us by Pricewaterhouse as part of the TEEP study. And they asked a very simple question. They took the 100 top companies, interrogated their, their annual reports on the left-hand side, and interrogated their CSR, or their sustainability reports on the right-hand side, and asked the question, is biodiversity and ecosystems an important strategic issue? And asked, also asked the question, is it at all relevant to your company? So if you look at the annual reports, only two of them out of 100 said it's an important issue because they were agricultural companies. And 82% said irrelevant or didn't have any mention of these words. But the same company's CSR reports or sustainability reports had nine companies saying it's an important strategic issue and only 42% saying it's not mentioning it at all. And the question comes to my mind, how is it possible for the same company to deliver such completely different answers to the same exact question? Yeah, from two different reports published at slightly few months away. I mean, sustainability report probably published on Christmas Eve so that you know, you're nicely drunk before you read it. And, and the annual report published when, when I read it and analysts read it and decide buy or sell. So clearly there's something happening here which is not very professional. And the answer is, to me, this is the answer is one report. You need to have all this reported in the same time at the same place as your, your annual reports. And in fact, that is one of our key recommendations on the business side. We do ask for a uh, uh, move towards estimating externalities of corporations and disclosing them, just as the way you disclose director's bonuses or disclose post balance sheet events or disclose contingent liabilities. There's a lot of stuff that we disclose in our annual reports, which is not required for balance sheet and P&L purposes, but it's useful because some stakeholder group has asked for it. And today there are lots of tools available. So the excuse of, oh, it's too difficult, we can't measure. There's, of course, TEAB on the economic side, but there's any number of technologies. And of late, there's even a, a WBCSD, a World Business Council report that has come out on ecosystem service valuation. In fact, the problem is the other way around. We have just too much, too much available for businesses. But nonetheless, what we are saying is that businesses should focus on these first four points, which is try to measure what you are not at, yet, at present managing. It will encourage a creation of MIS, a creation of management process around the company's impacts on nature, and it will help in the, in the long run uh, to control those impacts and to manage them. Now, we are also asking companies to engage with businesses and uh, try and uh, extend their influence and, and make governments aware that the companies are interested. I think at the end of the day, this is also about recognizing new rea realities because we are in a space in, at a time, ladies and gentlemen, where the world is much more complicated than it was uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. We are operating in a space which has human capital, natural capital, and physical and financial capital, all as part of what corporations use to add value and what governments have to manage to increase value to, for us as citizens. And then we have to ask, is, are, are the metrics that we are using, are the toolkit that we are using uh, sufficient? It's almost as if we are trying to navigate a three-dimensional space uh, we need something like a, a spaceship's bank of panels, but what we have instead is a simple mariner's compass. And that's the problem with looking at simple things like today's P&L accounts or balance sheet, or looking at GDP growth as a measure of national economic performance and success. These are just far too simplistic. It is not going to be sufficient to do that. We need to look at more and better metrics, and I think that also is very much what TEEB is about. So I think replacing, as I call, our antiquated economic compass before it is too late. Thank you very much indeed.